money, money, money. <laughs> Hello everyone, it's me. And today, let's uncover Disney's money. Actually, the bank to be general. You know, Mary Poppins spends a lot of time talking about how great supercalifragilisticexpialidocious is, but really downplays its critical role as a pickup tool. In the movie, one of the characters specifically says, One night I said it to me girl, and now me girl's me wife. Get on it, all you Tinderites. Forget your instagram -y photos and talking about your favorite place to eat avocado toast. It is all about plastering supercalifragilisticexpialidocious all over your profile. That stuff is is dating gold. Oh, yeah! <laughs> Internet, welcome to Chim Chimini Chim Chimini Film Film Theory. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Welcome to Film Theory. Oh, wait a minute. It should be Internet. One more time. Hello, Internet. Welcome to Film Theory. Hello. We analyze movies to the highest degree. That's right, friends. The remake of Mary Poppins is out now, and it's given Lin Manuel Miranda some new tracks for their Spotify playlists. And in honor of the punchy new Mary Poppins remix, today we're taking a look back at the original Mary Poppins back from 1964. Yeah. Oh, wow. 1964. That's a long, long time ago, gosh. Yeah, it is really that old. On a personal note, I just finished watching every Disney movie for the Disney Deaths trilogy we're in the middle of. And let me tell ya, not everything in that Disney vault stays fresh forever. Make Mine Music, Song of the South, hoo hoo boy, those have not aged well. But I okay, well, aging well films is a bit difficult. Ugh. I think it's safe to say that Mary Poppins is just one of those timeless movies that holds up. From 1964 to the time four-year-old Matt Pat danced Step in Time around my house in my underwear. Thought I was a chimney sweep. It was awesome. It was definitely four-year-old Matt Pat and definitely not 14-year-old Matt Pat. By 14, I'd put on a shirt. Anyway, as much as this movie is one of my favorites of all time, there is one thing that's always made me wonder. Who was right about the Tuppence? Now, in case you've forgotten the plot of Mary Poppins and by proxy your soul, let me refresh you so you know what I'm talking about. Mr. Banks, the stodgy banker, and Mrs. Banks, the airheaded suffragette, have Jane and Michael, their two adorable children. Adorable? Well, that's debatable, I must say. Their musical nanny, Mary Poppins, takes them on whirlwind adventures and teaches them life lessons, like making sure you step on other people's chalk drawings without paying them and treating medicine like candy. Lime cordial, delicious! Strawberry, mmm! One day, in a totally passive-aggressive move against their father for almost firing her, she sends the children to the bank with him and uses psychological manipulation to convince Michael that he should donate his two pence or tuppence to a beggar woman who sells birdseed. Okay, um, the wait, wait, what? Did you just say? What an impertinent thing to say. Me putting ideas into people's heads? Really? His father warns him. Wait, did you just see that? That was 1964, and then there was the eye roll. Oh my gosh. Wow, this is super classy, eh? Him about pigeon disease or something and instead twists his arm to do the responsible thing and invest his tuppence in the bank so that it gains compound interest. Yeah, try explaining that one to a five-year-old. When they get to the bank, a bunch of really intense bankers grab his change and Michael yells, which spooks other patrons in the bank to start asking for their money. The bank won't give someone their money. Then give me mine too. This tuppence causes a run on the entire bank, which results in Mr. Banks getting fired and ultimately having a crisis of conscience. In the end, Banks comes to his senses and uses the tuppence to buy a kite and fly it with his son. Everyone goes to the park for the most unbelievable scene in the entire movie, where like 50 people are all flying kites at the same time and none of them are getting their strings tangled up. True! From experience, a lot of accidents may happen. The incidents... The LDR, this tuppence plays a massive role in the movie and apparently on the entire banking system of Great Britain. So given the incredible importance of these two pennies, I can't help but ask, did Michael make the right call? After all, the bankers might be boring and a little bit handsy, but they do make a valid point. You can invest your money rather than buying bird seed so you can be rich and happy later, all while contributing to the major world industrialization like Railways through Africa, dams across
across the Nile, eats of ocean greyhound. Wow, I mean, two cents don't buy what it used to, I guess. You don't have to be Einstein to figure out that compound interest can be a powerful force. Even the quote, the most powerful force in the universe is compound interest, is frequently attributed to Albert Einstein. But as boring as investing might be, it seems to have worked well for the bankers, so who was right? What should Michael have done with the tuppence? Given that Mary Poppins is set over a hundred years ago, back in the year 1910. Whoa, back in the year 1910? That's like hundreds, wait, 110. Oh no, right now it's in the year 2021. So it's one, one, one. 111 years ago. Gosh. Hmm, coincidence? Hmm. <laughs> It's grand to be an Englishman in 1910. King Edward's on the throne. It's the age of men. We have a huge runway to actually accumulate interest. So we really get to see how this plays out and determine whether Michael should have trusted in the bank and what that tuppence would actually be worth today. And the results are surprising. Figuring out the answer to this seems like it should be simple. You just perform some basic interest calculations. But two pennies way back then turns out to be a lot more complicated than you'd first think. In 1910, Britain had a ridiculously complex money system involving words that sound silly to modern US viewers. Things like farthings and shillings. It's like fairy tale money, right? Well, not back in 1910 when one pence was actually worth one 240th of a pound, which would be like us having some coin that was worth a few tenths of a penny. The long story short, this system of currency is silly, but we gotta use it if we're gonna get ourselves an accurate calculation. Luckily, in 1971, Britain shifted over to a base 10 system like yeah, of course, coincidentally, base 10 is easy to count. Especially, especially, coincidentally, we have 10 fingers. Ta da! 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. like we have today, probably because no one in the world could figure out how much a candy bar cost over there. So Michael's tuppence is actually worth 0.08333333 repeating pounds, which is a little over 11 cents in today's terms. So that's gonna be our starting number. In 1910, the British interest rate on a normal savings account was 3.5%, which by today's standards is great. But it turns out to not be all that helpful for Michael. At 3.5% interest, Michael's deposit will earn him a whopping 0.56 farthings, which again is a meaningless number, but suffice it to say, it is really, really small. The farthing is one fourth of a pence, or penny. The two are interchangeable. The name actually comes from fourthing. The pence is fourth, hence the name farthing. Anyway, the farthing was the smallest unit of currency in Britain, so Michael earned less than one of the smallest form of currency Britain had at the time. And so, what do you think the bank does when you earn less than one of its smallest currency in the year that you have to earn it. They will round down because they can they cannot run up. If they run up, they will be creating money and back in the days it is just unheard of to create more money than wait what really? And I okay not too sure but um they will round down. Yeah, they round down. Well, they round down. And See? when you stop and think about it, that actually makes sense. If they didn't, they would in essence be creating new money out of thin air and giving it away if they were to round those partial cents up. And giving it away. So poor Michael, who didn't read the fine print when he invested, actually earns zero interest in his first year. But okay, that's one year out of 108 years. Except that's exactly what happens every single year over and over and over again, where the interest rate never gets high enough for Michael to even earn a single farthing. In short, as insane as it sounds, Michael's balance never grows larger than tuppence. Never. Two pennies for 108 years. That's the thing about compound interest. It only works if your interest each year is gonna be greater than zero. At the end of this analysis, I feel bad for the guy. No, I wanted to feed the birds. I know, buddy. That's all you wanted to do. So I decided to test out some more optimistic scenarios to see if we could at least get him any return turn out of this deal. Alright, optimistic. That means any, any results that is better than zero is a good result, sort of. Let's 
let's say that there was a way for him to earn some interest, like if his tuppence were part of a bigger bank account. How much would his tuppence earn if there was no rounding and it just accrued interest slowly? Again, using Britain's incredibly well-documented historical interest rates, we can calculate all this out from 1910 to 2018 and come up with Michael's new 100-year-old fortune of 2 pounds and 11 pence. <laughs> The equivalent of two dollars and seventy cents for all the Americans in the audience. Don't look what the um that is just that is irresponsible for the system to be like this. Change the system. Oh wait, did they, did they change the system? Yes, they did change the system. Look like Michael's gonna be taking you on any shopping sprees to Harrods anytime soon. But on the bright side, Michael's great grandson can buy himself a bloke coke and a bag of Maltesers from the Tesco. So at this point, I was like, I guess the lesson here is that banks will rip off your tuppence, and Michael would definitely have been better off buying birdseed rather than holding out over a century to buy a Jaffa cake and a bottle of water. It seems like this was clearly a scam, but there is one last avenue to explore here. The wide world of investments. When we get to the bank, I shall show you what may be done with your tuppence, and I think you'll find it extremely interesting. As the bank says, Michael's money could be part of global initiatives. But you fail to recognize that they are children. Five years old cannot recommend, cannot understand. Most five years old cannot uh, understand years. 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, 40 years, 50 years. They cannot, they fail to recognize because they have only lived for five years. I'm a child for, who lived for 5 years, I cannot recognize what is 10 years, I cannot, I just cannot fathom the amount of years that is way beyond what I've experienced, especially when my brain is still developing. So you see all this interesting stuff, it's only interesting when you have the knowledge of what it can do, the possibilities of it can do, but when you do not have the knowledge of it, this openness without education is just disastrous, yeah. Like, majestic self amortizing canal. Huh? Whatever the heck those are. Michael certainly doesn't seem to know. Oh, it fires the imagination. Mr. Dawes, the bank's ancient founder, extols Michael on the virtues of all kinds of ventures, like foreclosures, dividends, shares, and debtor sales. Yes, but you fail to recognize that all this are just. With great power comes great responsibility. If you have all this great power with all these great roles, you must learn. You must learn add additional skill to teach other people properly, alright? You can't expect me to teach someone on something in which they are not familiarized with, correct? Case in point, the children, uh, there's a special way of teaching children and there's a special way of teaching teenagers and there's a special way of teaching adults. Different individuals, different ways and methods, different paths moving forward. Some of these actually being really risky investments. But hey, this is in 1910. England's financial markets are soaring. London is the economic capital of the world. The UK has a 3% unemployment rate. It seems like a great time to invest. Okay, it seems like a great way to invest. Wait, great time. But, great protection, great depressions, the world wars, not the good. Mm. And it was until 1914 when a little something you might have heard of happened, World War One. When the Great War, or World War I, set in, much of the private industry fueling Britain's financial dominance ground to a screeching halt, as a huge portion of resources were reallocated to manufacturing munitions and all the other things that it takes to run a war. The specific industries that Mr. Dawes mentions in the song, shipyards, the mercantile, tanneries, and collieries, which I had to look up and are apparently coal miners, allocated funds and manpower to build for the war effort, all while losing their top men to be sent into trenches across Europe. But the British people were no dumb crumpets during this time. They sensed that all this war was destabilizing the economy, and they did what everyone else does when they feel insecure about their finances. They took all their money, and they stuffed it into mattresses. They began to withdraw money from the banks, which in turn led to fears that there would be a bank run. If everyone saw the economy in decline and then rushed to withdraw their money, there literally would wouldn't be enough banknotes in the country for everyone to have all their money back in cash. In response, the British Treasury began to print more cash at a rate of 5 million new banknotes a day. This wow. is a common thing to do in war times, and if you want to see how it usually goes, you can check out this Game Theory episode where we cover exactly that. But mm -hmm. So, think about it. Inflation, super inflation, hyper inflation, mega inflation, these things 
will be disastrous for everyone, for you, for me, for everyone. I'm gonna spoil it for you. It never ends well. When you start literally printing money and injecting it into the economy, any economist can tell you what happens. Inflation. Every new banknote that gets printed effectively devalues all the money that currently exists. It's the reason that the government can't just solve its debt problems by printing more money. And so what does that mean for Michael? Well, it means during the war, instead of his investment growing, his tuppence is actually losing value and by proxy buying power the whole time. Fortunately, there was still one investment opportunity available, war bonds. At the time, this would seem like a good financial move. War bonds had an interest rate of 5%, several points higher than the market interest rates at the time, and banks and citizens alike were encouraged to buy war bonds as a part of doing their patriotic duty. They were also considered safe because they were backed by the British Treasury rather than a business that can go under, so bonds are considered one of the lowest risk investments that you can possibly make. Fun fact, by the way, it's the same reason that China is really gung-ho about buying U.S. Treasury bonds these days. They're the most reliable investment that you can buy. So we have ourselves a safe investment with a high interest rate, all while supporting the war effort. Buying war bonds seems like a win-win for everyone involved, and even seems to align with Mr. Dawes' strategy for investing all the bank money. So how does this last-ditch effort to make any sort of money out of Michael's tuppence work out? Unfortunately, yet another tough lesson in history for all money banks. A decade after the war, in 1929, the world gets hit with the Great Depression. Remember all those war bonds that got that fantastic 5% interest rate? Well, the government didn't pay those back yet, and in 1932, Chancellor Neville Chamberlain called for investors to do their patriotic duty yet again, only this time, except a 3.5% return instead, with the overwhelming majority of war bonds just changing over to that new rate. I am altering the deal. Pray I don't alter it any further. Darth Vader might not have changed his deals again, but Neville Chamberlain absolutely did. The British government converted the war bonds from bonds into what's known as perpetuals. Perpetuals that give the government the right to not pay back the loans if they so chose. Hmm. What once was a very safe investment with a solid interest rate that helped support the war effort then became an IOU that you can either choose to pay back or not to pay back. Guess which one the British government chose? Surprise, surprise! Surprise, surprise, no effort has been made since the 1930s to repay any of those war bonds. It's believed that about 125,000 people are still holding onto their bonds, some of whom might have inherited them from parents or grandparents who bought them during World War I, still nothing paid out. Borrow money from people to pay for the war and then just decide afterward that you're not gonna pay it back. That sounds like a great deal for the British government and not such a great deal for Michael and his investment portfolio. Portfolio. The worst trade deal maybe ever signed anywhere. But Definitely a pretty bad deal, except maybe for that time when Neville Chamberlain said, Hey, Adolf, we'll totally let you take over Czechoslovakia if you promise not to attack us once you're done taking over the rest of Europe. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Adolf Hitler, seriously? You trust this guy not to attack your country in a war time? Seriously? Yeah, we're talking about that Neville Chamberlain. Made a lot of bad calls. So clearly Michael dodged a bullet by hanging onto that tuppence. But how about where it really ends up? Buying kite fixing materials. Was that the right choice? As it turns out, in what I'm sure was a complete accident on the part of Disney, it absolutely was. With tuppence for paper and strings, you can have your own set of wings. Mr. Banks was able to purchase both paper and string for tuppence in the movie, whereas to buy those items today would cost you between 5 and 10 British pounds, depending on the specific paper and string you're buying. And yeah, I know that sounds expensive, but there was literally a paragraph in an earlier version of the script dedicated to pricing out the grades of string and paper, so just be glad that I cut it down to the chase with this one. Even in our best case scenario, there was no way Michael would have been able to buy kite-making materials in 2018 with the money from that tuppence. So in short, after a long, harrowing journey to get here, yes, Michael, you made the right choice to spend your tuppence in 1910, and it turns out that flying your kite with your dad isn't just a cathartic family moment, but also a sound financial decision. Oh, uh, thank you so much for being so heartwarming and just loving. Thank you so much. But hey, that's just a theory. A film theory. And seriously, this new Mary Poppins movie better be good because my entire childhood is on the line. This is not a joke. I'm warning you, Lynn. Bert has been my hero for years. If your Cockney accent is not as bad as Dick Van Dyke's, I will be sorely disappointed.
<laughs> well, thank you so much for watching this, this video together with me. This video has been very interesting and very educational about it. Edutainment for the win! Yeah! Well, if you do like this video, please remember to like, share and subscribe to my channel and comment down below if you have anything to share with us. Don't forget to follow my channel and I sincerely appreciate all the support and encouragement for my work. Thank you all so much, sincerest appreciation and gratitude towards everyone. And I hope to see you all in my next video. But hey, that's just a theory, a film theory and cut. Thank you. And I hope to see you all in my next video. Bye bye! Once again, it's like, share, subscribe to my channel, and comment down below if you have anything to share with us. Subscribe.